So I'm going to have a go at making some of the ink that they're using in the Book of Kells. So you can see here on the right, this is a photograph of the original. This is my attempt doing something similar, matching the ink and the parchment. Uh, this is called Oak Gall ink. There's no known recipe for it, so I've been experimenting with what I think they would have had. Um, this is as far as I've got. Uh, it's a bit difficult to tell from a photograph and with the wear pattern, but I think this is quite close. It's quite a dark ink. Um, I think theirs looks tighter just because they're better at calligraphy than I am. But um, I think this ink behaves quite relatively similarly. And the parchment, as you can see, it's a bit lighter than the stuff for the illumination. This is because it hasn't been re-stretched. So again, this is one that's straight off the frame. Very little preparation. We've got quite a close match there. So I'll go through the process behind the ink in this now. So first thing I need to do is go and see if anybody's got an oak tree lying around that they don't need or won't notice. So this is a 30 year old sessile oak which I've coppiced at the end of March. And the reason for that is that in springtime that's when the oak trees have maximum tannin content. And the reason for getting a relatively young tree is that it makes the bark a lot easier to strip off. So once you dig into it, it should come off relatively easily in quite long strips. And in medieval times they would have been doing this for leather processing, so that would be the main industry. However, since uh, the famous oak gall wasp, which makes the oak galls for what we call oak gall ink, wasn't actually introduced to the UK until the 1830s, I think it's highly likely that they'd be using the bark to get the tannins to make the ink. So even though it's called oak gall ink, I don't think there's any oak galls in it until relatively recently. So I don't need too much. Um, if anything, they probably would have just collected a bit straight out of the tannin liquor. I'm just going to do a little bit extra now, because I might end up making a coracle or something, if I get the time. But even this one log's probably got enough to make an entire manuscript out of it, I reckon. It's just going to break up some of this oak bark into as small as chunks as easily possible. Fill this up with water, and then we'll soak it probably for a couple of days, maybe stick it in the hearth for a bit, just anything at all really to ensure we're getting all the tannins leached out of it, making it as strong as possible and then once it's a liquid we'll reduce it down a fair bit as well. So that's the bark soaking in the water. That's about 200 grams of bark and a litre of water. I normally wouldn't measure it, it's just, just easier to do these things by eye, reduce it and see what the liquid looks like. We're going to send this off to be analysed once we've got the results. So. So we've had this um, soaking and simmering in the hob, evaporating for a good few hours now, and that was a litre of water went in. You can see here, got a nice thick residue, and that's going to be absolutely full of tannins, which is what we need. So that's the consistency of it there. We're going to use these things here, which are nodules of naturally occurring iron pyrite, and within them is dormant bacteria. And if we can get these bacteria activated, they'll eat the iron pyrite and create ferrous sulfate as a byproduct. So, in order to do that, I'm just going to lay them out in a dish, cover them with some rain water, and we'll leave them somewhere warm. And over the next few days, maybe a few weeks, they should wake up, they should start eating through it, creating crystals, and we can scrape off the crystals and the watery solution, boil that down, add a little bit more iron to it, and we'll end up with ferrous sulfate, which is one of the main ingredients for our ink. Now this all could have easily been done in intro conditions, everything's available within the British Isles, it's a very simple process. And it's just relying on their knowledge of how to activate it. So I've had these by the fire overnight, and you can see just the little white marks starting to appear on them. And that's the bacteria starting to eat away on the 
pyrite and producing the ferrous sulfate we need. So these organisms just come back to life, could be millions of years old, could even be the same generation siblings of the ones the monks actually used. So it's fascinating to have something that we're actually working with contemporaries of the insular age now to produce inks in the same way. So these have been sitting for a few days now. I've had a bit of heat to them, had them around the hearth, and you can see the bacteria are getting to work. And what we've got there is what we want, so that's ferrous sulfate. So this is the native Dean cherry. As you can see here, this is probably winter frost damage, all bleeding down. It's made these here, which is cherry gum. And this is what I think they would be using as a binder. Because it's very similar to gum arabic, but obviously it's local and free. Because again, gum arabic would have been a big issue for importing. If we just see if we can loosen some of that, if you get the right type of injury, you can get a really nice big lump of it. And that'll be a good binder for a serious quantity of ink. You can see we've got some here, and then we've got more dripping down here. So it's, it's actually quite unusual to get this much in one tree. So they might have deliberately harvested it by injuring the tree or possibly introducing bacteria or something to it. It's another way to get it. So we're going to collect that, and that's another ingredient for our ink sorted. Right, so this is all the ingredients together. We're just going to cook them up now. So that is the concentrated tannins. So that's it cooked down to about 100 mils. See, it's really dark, and interestingly, it's already got a bit of mould on it. It's just been sitting for a few days. So we'll see what effect that has on it. And I've got the ferrous sulfate crystals, you can see there. Just been scraping those off the pyrite. A couple of grams of that. And then for the cherry, probably only need about half of this. It's uh, very concentrated, so you only need a tiny, tiny amount. So we're going to heat up the tannin solution first. I'm just going to do it in a hot plate today because we're in lockdown, can't be having fires out in the woods. But I'll stick in a wee clip of how that was done the traditional way, because I've done that before. So I've just got the tannins heating up here in a hot plate, because I've got to do stuff inside at the moment. And I'll dip it with a bit of parchment. And you can see it's getting darker. That's even just because it's in, in a little iron pot. So that's not even with the ferrous in yet. So I'm going to chuck in the ferrous sulfate now. And if I mix that around a bit, that should get even darker. So we'll give that another dip on the other end and see where we are. Yeah, that's getting darker. I think that needs to reduce more. So we'll reduce that down and see how it turns out. I might have to just keep adjusting the, the amount of cherry gum and the amount of water just to get the right viscosity for it to flow nicely on the quill. So what I do when I'm getting close to where I think it's supposed to be is I get sample the parts when I'm planning to write on and the quill I'm planning to write with just dip it in do initially just a wee few lines to test you know, nothing too neat just holding it and see if it's starting to behave in a way that I think you know this is something I could spend the day writing with and I think we're getting quite close there it'll dry a little bit darker so I'll leave that for a minute and see how it gets on but I mean this is completely unprepared parts and it's not had points or any surface preparations it's just made the insular way and it's very simple ink so there's, there's nothing here that wasn't made on site very very simply and that's already getting quite close to where I want it to be so the next stage now is if this behaves itself and still looks right in an hour or so you do what's called an abacatarian sentence, which is a little Latin phrase with all the letters of the alphabet in it. 
do that out a few times it's it's good practice but it also tells you about your materials if there's any little quirks or you'd want to maybe adjust the viscosity to get some nice extra pen movements a bit smoother that's where you'd find out if you had any little minor problems there so it's just a little period of adjustment each day um, but I think we're we're getting close there so getting quite used to this ink now just try and shallower pen angle it's made it a bit better and I'm writing with it warm makes it flow that wee bit better. Also it comes out darker rather than having to wait for it 